Are you content to be a Photoshop user or do you aspire to be a Photoshop Pro? If Pro is your ambition, then here are eight things you need to know. Now, these are not tips or tricks or even words of advice. These are eight keys that you need to enter the hallowed halls of Photoshop Pros, starting with the primordial ooze of channel operations, aka chops versus layers, both of which allow you to achieve pro quality effects. However, channel operations allow you to work flat. And so I'll create a duplicate of this image. I'll call it shadow because that's what it's going to be. And then I'll offset this image 40 pixels to the right and 40 pixels down like so. Next, I will apply Gaussian blur, which is one of the defining commands inside Photoshop. It applies the bell shaped curve to the edge of the softness so that we're never seeing Seeing the edges the letters just disappear into oblivion at which point I'll click OK now I need to subtract the letters and so I will choose calculations and I will set the source to flat type right there I need to invert it however set to screen and that gives us the drop shadow now I want to take this photograph from the dreams time image library link in the description and set it inside the type using apply image and so all I need to do is set this guy to dreams time and make sure the blend mode is set to screen then click OK and now I need to bring in the drop shadow by choosing that command once again choosing shadow this time around I want the alpha channel and I'm going to set it to multiply like so. Click OK and the deed is done. We now have a drop shadow that's every bit as good as anything we could create using layers. However, it's safe to say that layers are a little more convenient. So I'll just choose drop shadow right there. Come up with these settings in advance. So I'll click OK. And now I'll take that Dreamstime image and clip it inside the type. The advantage, of course, is that I can now drag the letters around. Not something I could do with a channel operation. And I can can go ahead and edit the text as well and so it's all made much more convenient by layers but it all started with chops and by the way if you're enjoying what you're seeing so far bearing in mind that i've only showed you one of eight things i'm going to be sharing with you then take a moment to subscribe now another great thing about photoshop is its wealth of meticulous selection functions and so by way of example i have the first u.s airmail stamp from 1918 it's a two-color job the paper had to be fed through twice, once for the frame and once for the plane. You can imagine that it went wrong on at least one occasion and we ended up with this famous stamp right here. The interesting thing is this guy's worth about a hundred bucks. This one at last auction went for two million. So I thought we'd engage in a little bit of lighthearted forgery. I'll start by going up to the select menu and choosing color range. Anything that's white will be selected. Anything black will be deselected. I want to select the plane, of course, so I'll click somewhere inside of it, almost like I'm using the magic wand tool. That gives us, I don't know, a kind of delicate selection. So I'll crank up the fuzziness value, which is going to select outside the stamp as well. Click OK. And now I'll shift alt or shift option drag with the rectangular marquee tool to select just the plane. Now I'll copy the selection and I'll move to this layered composition right here and paste. Now it looks pretty darn good, just like that. It's a little lightweight though, don't you think? So I'll give it some heft by adding an outer glow effect that's set to this bright shade of blue, multiply 50% opacity, looks great. Click OK. And now to increase the value of this asset, I'll go to the edit menu, choose transform and choose rotate 180 degrees and just like like that we have an image that were you to pass it off as the real thing might land you in federal prison so don't do that instead let's take a look at a third defining function inside photoshop edge sharpening and so notice this guy is by no means out of focus however it lacks a certain amount of definition i want the teeth and the eye to be absolutely tactile so i'll start with the oldest sharpening function inside photoshop unsharp mask so called because it uses blur to sharpen 
I'll crank the amount value up to its maximum of 500%. And then notice the distinction between the bright and dark edge right here. If I crank the radius up to 12 pixels, we're drawing brighter and darker edges, as you can see. Now, typically for print, you want something in the neighborhood of three pixels. For screen work, something in the neighborhood of one or even lower. I'll take it to three. Notice that we are sharpening the noise inside the image. That's the function of this threshold value. However, it results in pockmarks, as you can see. So things are either sharpened like these purple details or not sharpened at all. Whereas we also end up with some haloing. If you want to avoid that, another way to work is to take advantage of the newest sharpening function, which is camera raw. And so I'll go ahead and choose this guy, camera raw filter, and then I'll twirl open detail right here and crank the sharpening value up to 150%, which is as high as this one goes. Then I'll twirl this open and crank the radius value to three, just so we're comparing apples to apples. Now to get rid of the noise, we've got this masking function, which is so great. I'm alt or option dragging on the slider triangle. Anything that's white will get sharpened. Anything that's black won't. We have smooth transitions in between. And then finally, detail sharpens the high frequency stuff, which is noise oftentimes. So I'll take this down to five and click OK. And now we can see the difference. This is what I achieved using Unsharp Mask. And this is what I'm getting with Camera Raw. All right, now for a fourth thing every pro should know about Photoshop, and that is image retouching. Now, obviously, there's a million different ways to retouch inside Photoshop. I'm going to be focusing my attention on the best new Photoshop tool in years, the Remove tool. And notice that I've got Gen AI turned off for the moment, sample all layers on, and remove after each stroke turned off as well. And that way, I can apply a bunch of different strokes to an independent layer. I applied these in multiple passes, by the way. Way, and then I achieve this very smooth skin right here. So this is before and this is after. But let's say at a point you decide to bring out the big guns in the form of Gen AI. The thing to know is that it costs basically a credit per brush stroke. Now you're sitting on tons of credits, so you might as well use them in my opinion because they don't accumulate. They just reappear every month, by the way, depending on your plan. But anyway, I'm going to paint a few brush strokes. And if you paint two brush strokes that coalesce into one, then that just counts as one brush stroke, by the way, in terms of your use of Gen AI. And so I'm sitting on 739 credits, by the way. And so I just painted what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different brush strokes. Let's see what Photoshop comes up with. Sure enough, that cost me 10 credits. I'm now down to 729, but given the results, this is before and this is after. Personally, I'd say it's well worth it. Hey, real quick, would you like to see a few of these features in action? For example, I've mentioned that Gaussian Blur is one of the bedrock features of Photoshop, so much so that you can build sharpening using a combination of Gaussian Blur, the Apply Image Command, and a couple of old school blend modes, add and subtract to see it unfold in a way that will blow your mind. Join my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash deek now. And now, Back to eight ways to go pro in Photoshop. All right, now let's talk about smart objects, which serve as containers that protect an image from harm. I would say this poor little octopus here requires some protection. This is perhaps the worst image I've ever put out for public scrutiny, but it's going to look great. I'll double click on the background and call this guy octopus. And then I'll press the M key to switch to the rectangular marquee tool, right click and choose convert to smart object. And now I can do pretty much anything I want to this image non-destructively. I'll go up to the edit menu and choose free transform. And then I will scale this image to make it quite a bit bigger. And then I'll go ahead and drag it over to the left like so right about there should work. And I'll press the enter key. And then I'll go ahead and zoom in. And now if I was to invoke the keyboard shortcut for free transform, which is control T command T on the Mac, then you can see all my settings remain intact because not a single pixel was harmed. All right. Now, I want to correct the image and I can do so using any filter I like. They'll all be applied when available as 
non-destructive smart filters. So I'll choose camera raw filter. I'm not going to bore you with all the settings I applied. I'll just switch to presets right here. Notice we will end up with this colorful octopus. All these colors are endemic to the image. However, let's start with higher contrast just so we can build to that climax. And I'll click OK in order to accept that change. And we have a much higher contrast octopus. It looks a lot better thanks to this non-destructive application of camera raw filter. If I want to make further modifications to bring out those colors, for example, I have only to double click on that item. And then here inside the color region, I will crank the vibrance up to 90 and I'll take the saturation to 80. I know, ridiculous, right? However, you're going to see that this makes a huge, wonderful difference to the image. I'll grab the white balance tool and I'll click right about there. And all of a sudden, the colors blossom like crazy. These colors were just lying dormant inside this image, at which point I'll click OK to accept that change. And we have an incredible modification that we've applied entirely non-destructively because I used a smart object. At feature number six, we have Liquify, which allows you to brush in distortions. And so I've got a couple of AI images that I created with the help of Project Neo, and I want them to match each other so that I can create this final love shark right here. And so I'll right click inside this image and choose convert to smart object. That way I can apply Liquify as an editable smart filter so I can go back and change my settings anytime I like. Then I'll reduce the opacity a little bit, go up to the filter menu and choose liquify. And notice that I have show backdrop turned on so I can see all the layers. I'll make my brush much, much larger using the right bracket key and I'll brush this guy upward. Now the problem at this point is that I'm seeing two copies of the layer I'm working on, which is not what I want. So I'll change this to big heart, which is the layer in the background, the one I'm trying to match. And now I'm using the right bracket and the left bracket keys, the square bracket keys that is, which are to the right of the P is and Paul key on an American keyboard in order to change the size of my brush. Now, of course, you can be as careful or as uncareful as you like. I'm working quickly. So I might not get the smoothest results, but I could always go back and change my settings later just by double clicking on liquify. Anyway, I think this looks pretty good and I'll click OK. And now I'll press the zero key to increase the opacity to 100%. Notice we do have some wrinkles right there. All I need to do is double click on liquify in order to make that better. However, what I'm going to do is add a blank layer mask by alt or option clicking on the layer mask icon and I'll press the B key to switch to the brush tool. And that way I can brush in my shark face right there like so. And then if I turn on this layer of color right here, we have what amounts to a very nice match. And speaking of nice matches, if you're in the seamless compositions inside Photoshop, then you you owe it to yourself to master blend modes. They start with the darkening modes right here, best of which is multiply. Then we have the lightning modes, the best of which is screen. And then the contrast modes, the first and foremost of which is overlay. Know those three and you're doing better than most. And so for example, what I want to do in this case is I want to drop out the whites and keep the blacks. I could select the whites using the magic wand tool and delete them, but then that's a permanent modification and I'd have jagged edges. Why not just apply the best of the darkening modes, multiply, and you get this effect right here. All right, I'll undo that change, which is going to send me back to normal, which is like turning the blend mode off. I'll invert the layer by pressing Control or Command I, and I'll change the blend mode to screen this time, and we get this effect. You can even try out overlay on a lark. Let's see a more real world example. I created this header for my weekly free newsletter, deek.com. And so let's say I want to take this circle here, this blue circle and use it to colorize the stuff below. I could just change the blend mode to color. Sometimes it's just so easy. And now I also want to create a darkening effect. So I'll jump the layer by pressing control or command J. And now I'll change its blend mode to multiply. So you can combine blend modes together as long as you have multiple layers. Let's say I want to take this aperture and I I just want to blend it 
with the stuff in the background. Anytime you think that, just blend it, darn it. Try Overlay is a great way to work. You can also experiment with soft light to back it off and hard light to apply it more strongly. And also, I'll go ahead and undo that change and I'll turn on this live text layer right there. I want these letters to brighten everything behind them, so I would apply screen. And the great thing about blend modes is try them, you'll like them, you can't go wrong. All right, now for the eighth and final thing that every pro should know about Photoshop, and that's the difference between the three color modes, RGB, CMYK, and Lab. I'll switch to the channels panel and notice I've changed the preference setting, so I'm seeing the channels in color. This is the way that Photoshop actually perceives them. Here's the very dark channel of blue, by the way. These are the primary colors of light, the so-called additive color mode. And as a result, as we add light, we're adding brightness to the image. So red plus green gives us a maximum luminance of yellow. Now our eyes are least sensitive to blue, but if we want those yellows to turn a neutral white, then we need it to be turned on. All right, now I'll go up to the image menu, choose mode and choose CMYK. But before I do, this is straight strictly for pre-press. If you're printing to a local inkjet device, then stick with RGB and let the printer driver perform the conversion. However, let's say I'm going to commercially reproduce this image, so I'll choose CMYK, at which point I have inks where before I had light. And each one of these inks absorbs the light, so cyan absorbs red, magenta absorbs green, and yellow, the very bright yellow, absorbs the very dark blue. Now that means cyan, magenta, and yellow by themselves should be able to convey the entire image However, printing is an imperfect process. We have very faint shadows, and so to give them heft, I'll turn on the key color of black. All right, I'm going to undo that conversion. So we're back to RGB, and I'll choose image mode lab color. This is a non-destructive color conversion, by the way. So you should be able to go back and forth between lab and RGB as many times as you like. Lab stands for lightness, by the way, or luminous if you prefer, as well as two opposing color axes, A and and B, better known as tint in the case of A, and temperature in the case of B. You can turn them both on to see all the colors independent of the luminance levels. However, I'm going to switch to lab so I can show you a really great trick. This is how you increase saturation on a selective basis by pressing Control L, Command L on the Mac for levels. Notice lightness has a very rich histogram, whereas A, tint that is, has a compressed histogram. But now this black point value becomes a green point value. And if I I take it up, I'm increasing the saturation of the greens. And now if I tap over to the white point value, it's now a pink point value. And I'm increasing the saturation of the pinks. If you prefer magentas, that's not quite right, but I quibble. I'll switch to B now, which is temperature. And now this black point value, watch the sky becomes a blue point value. And so I'm increasing the saturation of the blues and I'll tap over to the white point value, which is now yellow. And that is going to increase the saturation of the foliage. And so I'll click okay and this my friends is before and this is after did i get everything or did i miss a favorite pro technique of yours let me know by commenting below and then subscribe and turn on notifications and for an adventure in sharpening in which we take photoshop apart and put it back together again join me at patreon.com slash now and then go to deke.com and sign up for my absolutely free newsletter i'm deke mcclellan this is deke now